What's up, everybody? This is DDP back with another edition of AE Dynamite Reviewed. Now, in this case, we had a very unusual show. It is the first AEW show with no audience in attendance. They have an outdoor setup. It's boxed around. You can kind of see at certain times when the camera pans. I don't know if they set up in like a parking lot or what it was. Still a pretty impressive setup, but it definitely was not their typical routine in this case. And we open with Cody Rhodes cutting a promo. No announcers, no initial pyro, empty arena, and Cody Rhodes. And he's walking in his promo the line between reality, you know, the seriousness of the COVID-19 virus and everything going on, coronavirus, and also blurring it with some kayfabe, which is really excellent work, I think. Kind of takes that real world element and keeps kayfabe blends it with what's going on right now with the elite the division within the elite specifically hangman adam page and how he and of the young bucks mac jackson are not on the same page and he builds that into a way basically saying you know we're heading into blood and guts against the inner circle we have to get on the same page and basically it's even weirder because as he's essentially calling for the other guys to come out, no music hits. Cody Rhodes was just already in the ring. He didn't have music. Uh, Matt Jackson and Kenny Omega come out. They don't have any music. They come out together. You still don't have Nick Jackson. He's still... I don't know if he's legitimately injured or if they're just doing this within kayfabe terms. They basically say he's too injured to even fly right now. And so he's not at the event. And so there's a lot of division within the elites but as they're essentially talking about it they address you know we don't know what's going on in this in, in the world basically right now there's a chance that even with what we're doing now there's a chance there won't be dynamite next week like they might be shut down to an even greater degree now that you're having these new restrictions put on limiting gatherings of 50 or more people and i don't know what that means for aew i don't know what that means for wwe that's a whole different subject but Basically, they're trying to address the seriousness of the real world while blending back to kayfabe and the task ahead of them. And Matt Jackson, when he's on the mic, essentially says, you know, all everything you're saying sounds great and I agree, but there's a problem here. And he's essentially implying the problem is we're not all on the same page and we're not all trying to be on the same page. There's only three of us in the ring right now and there should be even with Nick out four of us in the ring and he essentially addresses the fact that hangman adam page is separating himself from the group now cody when he spoke earlier did a great job i thought i i've said before and i've said it many times now i think hangman adam page has superstar potential i don't know why he wasn't a bigger deal in ring of honor but he is a great mix of light heavyweight athleticism and style, along with some real power moves. He's not your prototypical Vince McMahon type model, but I still think he has serious star power written all over him. And Cody basically addressed that. And so Matt Jackson essentially calls for Hangman to come out. He asks him, Hangman comes out, still sipping on his drink. In this case, it wasn't beer. It, was, uh, it looked like a whiskey he was drinking. And Matt basically asks him, tonight and at Blood and Guts, can we count on you? Will you fight with us? Hangman just gives kind of a toast or whatever with the glass, raises the glass, and you kind of see him mouth, yep, and he leaves. Uh, Kenny Omega jumps on the mic and basically says, all right, let's start the show, turn up the lights, let's get the pyro, and let's go. Now, I will say this. I know I spent a lot of time on that intro. Um, I loved something that AEW did. WWE is really struggling right now with their live events because they don't want to put on a wrestling match in an empty arena when you don't have a crowd because you're going to hear everything you're going to hear every call out between the superstars not just john cena terms think about that you can hear john cena even when you've got tens of thousands of people in the stands now compare to when it's an empty arena and you basically got the commentary team the referee and the two wrestlers in the ring you're going to hear everything so wwe has been really limiting the number of matches and to an extent aew did here as well tonight but what i loved was that they worked around it. They basically took the other superstars, the other people uh, on camera, and they made them the crowd. And that way, you still kept jawing. Like, you had MJF and Sean Spears basically back and forth, two heels basically 
talking shit the entire night. They're interacting with the guys in the ring. They're taking bets on every individual match and all that. Just great stuff over there. Keeps building their characters, keeps them fresh in your mind, even though neither of them are competing here. You are allowed to then advance the storyline with Jake the Snake Roberts and Lance Archer, who had a vignette cut in this show as well. And a lot of great things there. You keep some semblance of an atmosphere, and it helps better the an environment and atmosphere overall compared to what WWE's had to do in their last couple of shows with no one in attendance. So I loved that. But yeah, it's it's interesting in this case. So we open up with a big match here. We're going to open up with a six-man tag team match. And it's the best friends, Chuck Taylor and Trent, along with, or, excuse me, it's not a... It, this one is not a um, six-man tag match. There is one later on. That's the main event. This is just a standard tag team match. It has best friends Chuck Taylor and Trent along with Orange Cassidy. He sits in on commentary, never really says anything, just kind of does his usual sloth style thing. And then it's against the Lucha Bros. This is a solid first match. Now, I felt like early on, Ray Phoenix did a lot of the heavy lifting for Lucha Bros. He got worked over a lot by the uh, best friends in this case. A lot of isolating him, a lot of hard striking, hard kicks, especially to the hamstring. I can't imagine how bruised and welted up Trent's uh, hamstring must have been by the end of the match, because good God, some of these kicks, and you can just hear, especially with limited atmosphere around, crowd noise and all that, just how loud some of these pops are. And now I know, the wrestler slaps, as he does a kick, slaps his own leg to kind of amplify the sound. But these are solid shots here as well. And I can't imagine how you know knotted up his hamstring and bruised it must have been by the end of the night. Because he took about 12 of these kicks over the course of the match. Uh, eventually, things do get a little sloppy. This show actually had a couple sloppy moments. Uh, Trent goes to do a suicide dive, I think, on Pentagon Jr. outside. And he basically catches himself and changes it into just almost like a falling double axe handle off the apron. Really ugly. He kind of saves it. It's not a scary, dangerous spot, but it, it's sloppy. It's a it's a weird look. You can kind of tell in real time, like, oh, 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 okay. Well, that didn't go right. It, it's just kind of a thing like that. You have a great moment as well where Orange Cassidy then does his, I don't know what his hands in pocket basic it's basically the coffin drop that alan darby does but his hands are in his pocket does that dive off of the raised elevated uh announced desk area into phoenix and pentagon jr and that was that was a great moment as well don't know why that's not an automatic dq but it's not um and throughout this match it's pretty solid pretty solid for the most part in the end uh lucha bros get the win you get a dick kick city basically by Pentagon Jr. And they set up for the package for basically the spike package pile driver off the top rope. The Lucha Bros finishing move. Its name escapes me as well right now for some reason. The name of that move. Overall, I think it's a solid opening match. I give it three stars. I really like how Best Friends, they've really been elevating that team lately. I think they're realizing how over they are. And there's a great moment in this too. The Best Friends crowd pop thing is they always clear the ring and they take a moment to kind of like, oh, and then they like run to each other and like hug each other. And it's just this stupid, stupid bro love uh, thing that always gets a pop. Now in this case, you know, there's no fans in attendance, but in light of social distancing, they go to do it and then they kind of like stop and they do just like the elbow bump thing that, you know, people are saying you need to do instead of actual handshakes and hugs and things of that nature. So funny little moment there. Overall solid match. I give it a three star rating for the opening i know i initially said i didn't want to do star rating system but i kind of feel like if i'm going to review the show and actually talk about some of these matches you kind of need to have some barometer you can set second match we have a four-way dance if you will with uh the women's division penelope ford accompanied by kip saban rio the first aew women's champion chris statlander and hiraku shida now this is a short match and it is a sloppy match. Penelope Ford has a lot of athletic ability. You can see that. They tell you that she uh, was formerly a cheerleader. And I believe they also said gymnast to some extent. Um, you see the athleticism, but she is green. They make a point of saying in the match, AEW does a unique thing where 
they kind of keep a running tally. So you're not going to have someone theoretically just pop out of nowhere, jump to the front of the fray. And, you know, you're not going to have a Jinder Mahal situation, basically, most of the time, in theory. And they keep ratings on that week to week. So you can kind of see the momentum, who's rising, who's falling. It's a smart thing, and it does give it a little bit more of a real sport feel. And I like that. But they make a point of saying a couple times in this match, every woman in the ring is a in the top five of the women's rankings, except for Penelope Ford, although they say, hey, she got an upset victory last week on AEW Dark over Riho, so therefore she's at the cusp of breaking into that. I don't know if in the women's division, is it a top 10 rating? Is it a top 5 rating? I have no idea. But Penelope Ford has an ugly match here. And surprisingly, she's asked to do a lot. I didn't understand that. Right off the bat, very sloppy start. Uh, Riho in her 90-pound ass. She's been wrestling since she's 9. She does some cool stuff, yeah. But it's it's hard to take seriously her beating up on anybody because of her size. She's caught several times in midair by Statlander and uh, Sheeta, I believe. Throwing around like a rag doll. I did actually think at one point she got legitimately hurt because she gets caught up uh, in the ropes in a way where she's kind of laying on her back, draped across the second rope, her legs up on one corner and her upper body uh, and head and shoulders on the other. And her midsection is just right there in the corner. And then they do a spot where Riho is then suplexed by Statlander on top of her in the corner. And just the way that Riho folds up is, or excuse me, Sheeta is suplexed onto Riho. And it's just a scary look. And you, Rio looks like she's legitimately hurt. She sells it very well. I, I legitimately thought she might be taken out of the match at that point. But she does come back in and get some heat. Uh, you have several times throughout this match as well where Kip Saban is just constantly interfering. Never really uh, anything is done about it by the referee. He grabs both Statlander and she does legs at one point. Uh, he interferes with other things as well. He's just constantly interfering on Penelope Ford's behalf. Both Statlander and Sheeta both, you know, ping pong, knock him around, punch him in the face. He turns, gets punched by the other one, falls down, scrambles away. Then there's a moment later on where Riho takes his ass out, jumping off the apron, I believe. And you just have these moments where you're just like, good God, man, he's getting punked by everybody. Hell, even post-match he gets punked, but we'll get to that. Uh, it, there's a couple really bad botches by Penelope Ford in this match. Like the first start of the match, he has an ugly like scramble over to go fight against uh, Riho, kind of continuing with that feud. And it just looks awkward and fumbling. But she goes for a Hurricane Rana off the top. So she jumps off the top and is going to catch Statlander with a Hurricane Rana. So something is effed up here because she goes too far over the top. Basically, her ass lands on Statlander's head. Statlander has to almost duck a little bit. And so Ford like skids off her back, and there, there's no covering it up. It, it is a terrible botch. Thankfully, no one is hurt in the situation. They then set up a moment later where she does kind of redeem the spot with a reverse Hurricane Rana, not off the top rope or anything on Statlander, and she nails that beautifully. I think Statlander did a great job kind of putting her over and helping her fix that spot, which kind of masked a really bad spot for her earlier on. But yeah, there, there are a couple really bad botches within the span of about a minute by Penelope Ford in this match, and it kind of just gave the impression that maybe she's still a little too green, but we'll see. Um... Basically, to jump to the end here of this match, you get a weird spot where Sheeta sets up uh, with a basically sliding knee strike on Penelope Ford, who's down on uh, her hands and knees at that point. Basically, or she's on her knees, kind of upright and dazed. And you have Sheeta run off the ropes, come back with a knee strike, kind of similar to what Daniel Bryan does, only her opponent is already on her knees. She's not standing up. Penzer does not get a three count. And then... Or excuse me, that, that is what put her away. She basically hits, I think, the Falcon Arrow right before that that Penelope Ford kicked out of. And then they make a comment like, nobody kicks out of the Falcon Arrow. Falcon Arrow doesn't put anybody away. Then she does the knee strike, and it's just one, two, three. And no one else gets involved in that time. So Sheeta wins, and I think that's the correct pick in this case. But it is a strange development it, it didn't feel like the flow was right this is a really short match i've already the time i spent talking about it practically accounts for the entire runtime of the match i basically gave a lot of uh depth to that 
But yeah, it's it's not a good match. I, I would give this like one and a half stars. This is not a match I would write home about. After the fact, they're interviewing Colt Cabana in the crowd area there, and he's had a couple matches with AEW. He's talking about um, the match in general, and he basically, he's kind of putting over Penelope Ford, which is weird given her very, very, I think, poor performance in the match, the worst performer of the four, even though she had one of the cooler spots as well with the reverse Hurricane Rana spike. But as he's talking about this, he basically says, oh, I think she, I think she would be better suited if she didn't have her loser boyfriend interfering so much, at which point... Kip Saban then comes over again and is running his mouth. They get into a bit of a shoving match. Colt Cabana slaps him across the face. And Kip basically has a look of like, how dare you? And they leave. And it's just like, okay, so I guess they're setting up a feud there. But it's just, it's a really weird, it's a really weird development. Like, Kip gets punked by everybody if throughout this. All, all three other women and uh, Colt Cabana who is a quality wrestler, but it, it's just a weird, it's a weird look. So we then cut then to a, another um, interview, basically. It's not even an interview. It's not even like a live in-person thing. They're still telling us John Moxley is not cleared, medically suspended, whatever you want to say, to not be at Dynamite. He's talking with Shivani in a parking lot, and it's basically just a standard cookie cutter like, oh, I'll, I'll be back, and I'll get the inner circle, and I'll get my payback, and you'll have to pry this belt out of my cold dead hands and blah 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 it, it's the same cookie cutter shit we've been hearing it means nothing and then they have a weird moment where he gets in this stupid nice car speeds off and i'm like that doesn't feel keeping with the john moxley character to me like the whole point was jericho when he was trying to recruit him to the inner circle is he's offering him this stupid nice ride and and by the way it's the same car so i guess they're keeping kayfabe sort of like as if it actually happened because moxley stole the car which okay um but yeah moxley speeds off in this car and i'm like i thought the whole point was that he like didn't get bought or sell out or whatever he was like kind of the just blue collar every man and there he goes speeding off in this absurd car with suicide doors and all that but uh, whatever. I'm not going to grade promos or vignettes. I'll say that. Uh, I'm keeping it just at the matches. We then go to another tag team match. That's a common theme in this show. Uh, Butcher and the Blade against Jurassic Express. This is another pretty solid match, but I noticed something early on. This time it's Blade being picked apart and worked over for much of the early part of the match. Again, by the good guys. It's following the same formula as the first match. You have the smaller of the two heel members being worked over by the good guys for a good part of the early match like he's getting picked over Jurassic Express nailing some great great strings of wrestling there uh I really am impressed with Jungle Boy he now he is a twig out there but his athleticism and quickness is not to be undersold and he's only 22 maybe he can fill out you know grow in and fill out that frame a little bit better and then he could be a huge star down the road i'm not saying like i see like a world title reign or anything like that but i could see him being a big big star certainly again 22 years old luchasaurus holy crap luchasaurus man the flexibility and the versatility of his offense how flexible he is in some of these cases some of these kicks and stuff he's hitting just roundhouse kicks on dudes the dude's like 6'9 like 275 he is just a built house of muscle and then he does like top rope dives and shit like that and he like they look natural like he moves like a much smaller more nimble man in this case and i guess that's where the you know luchasaurus you know his name comes from but holy crap great great match um for him in terms of him standing out jungle boy had some great moments too you do have another botch as well um that comes later on where jungle boy is setting up it's not so much his fault he's being thrown over the he's being basically backdropped and i think that butcher is supposed to catch him but he's thrown too far or too high by blade maybe his weight wasn't judged properly he basically skims over the top of butcher who i think was supposed to catch him and it could have gone bad but jungle boy catches himself on the ropes and he still tumbles kind of awkwardly as if he still was getting hurt i think a better save would have been if he had in real time landed which it looked like he was going to land anyway before he just kind of awkwardly spun out and then it would have looked like he just reversed it 
and then turn and got popped off the apron. I think that would have looked a little better, but nice save by him. A little bit sloppy there, but nothing crazy. Uh, in the end, you get a very sloppy finish moments later, though. Jurassic Express do win this match. You have MJF, who had previously hired uh, Butcher and the Blade. You don't have Bunny in the show, I noticed. But you have Butcher and the Blade taking orders from MJF at ringside to put away Jurassic Express. And as they're trying to set up for their finisher, uh, you get this breakdown situation. In the end, you get Butcher thrown outside. You have an assisted cutter essentially come from Jurassic Express. So you have Luchasaurus set up uh, Blade as if he's going to do like a tombstone. But then he kind of flapjacks him out for Jungle Boy to hit essentially a cutter. And... Jungle Boy hits the ropes, and you can tell he wants to come back and suicide dive to take out Butcher. But as he's getting to the ropes, he realizes Butcher never got up. Butcher's still laying on the ground selling what knocked him out of the ring a moment ago. And so then he just takes this awkward step out and just kind of like dives on him, like not even like a physical way, just like almost as if he's trying to hold him down. It's like three seconds, three or four seconds between the time Jack, uh, Jurassic Express hit their move, their final move, and that botch happens. And then Luchasaurus is like, oh shit. And he just pins Blade for the three count. It's like, that was, that was a shitty botched ending, but whatever. I give it two stars. Again, you had great moments there. Butcher and Blade, their stock seems to be dropping a little bit. They're still a physical tag team, but they're not being given momentum. Conversely, uh, Jurassic Express is definitely on an upward swing. Jungle Boy had some great moments to shine, although he was unfortunately part of like two or three botches in this match. Two of them I don't think are on him at all. And then you have uh, Luchasaurus, who in these short bursts where he can really show off is phenomenal. Now, I don't think he's the guy that you could build around as like a by himself star wreaking havoc but within this operation with him being the muscle and the complementary piece for jurassic express which has obviously two very scrawny undersized guys although i think jungle boy's height is you typical it's just his frame is so small i think you have a lot you can do with that so jurassic express on an upward swing butcher and the blade dropping back then we move from here to the reveal of the exalted one the long rumored exalted one for three months Bruh. Dark Order is in the ring. They're talking about the reveal. You have SCU who's there at ringside. Christopher Daniels and Kazarian. And I didn't see Scorpio Sky, but they come out and they're like, oh, enough with this crap. You've been talking about it forever and it's nothing. It's nothing. Then you cut to a promo package with initially a weird masked voice. You get a white robed figure. White with white ro ro uh, robe with gold trim. He opens up the hood and it's Brody Lee, a.k.a. Luke Harper from WWE. His beard's trimmed back a bit. He's a little less wild looking than he was before. The new attire is weird. I don't like it. It's just like baggy black leather pants, black singlet uh, tank top top, and just like purple logo. It's the Dark Order logo. Here's what's weird, though. So they're watching the video package. While they're watching the video package... Uh, Brody Lee basically talking about how I am the exalted one and I will do blah, blah, blah. It, when the promo ends, the pre-tape promo ends, Daniels and Kazarian turn around and now Brody Lee is in the ring behind them. And it's like, dude, there's, there's no one here. There's, there's no crowd. There's nothing to distract you. Like, it, it's stupid that, that, that they did that kind of reveal spot there, I think. But whatever, they lay him out. He hits his discus lariat, lays out SCU. And what's really weird is he takes a moment to kind of stand there. He's not even posing with the rest of the Dark Order. He doesn't feel like he fits, even though they're making him the leader. And then he leaves the ring. The rest of the Dark Order is still celebrating. He leaves the ring and the camera follows him. And he just looks like he doesn't, I mean, this is my interpretation. I just kind of had the feeling he didn't even like like the segment or like being a part of it. He like did what he had to, what he was asked to do. And then he's like, oh, fuck it. I'm out of here. And he just like leaves. And like the Dark Order is still celebrating. And you're like, it's not really leader. I mean, he's not directing traffic. He's not like, you know, he doesn't have the guys looking to him like, yes, this is him. Our chosen one or whatever. Very weird debut. I, I think 
Brody Lee finally, I'll say this, his promo, he cut a much better promo than I've ever heard him given the opportunity to express in WWE. And I think that is, this is going to be a much better experience for him because of that. But I do get the feeling he doesn't like being a part of the cult, even though in this case, he's now going to be running the cult. But we'll see what happens with that. Um, not not super impressed. Glad to see his debut. Glad they're trying to put him in at the figurehead of one of their biggest stories they're doing right now, their biggest storylines. But it, it's a weird debut. Very forgettable in this case. We then cut to the next vignette, which is Lance Archer and Jake the Snake. And in it, you basically have out in some country bumpkin nowhere uh, this makeshift-ass ring with Lance Archer in the ring and all these guys outside the ring, these, you know, hicks and all that who want to fight him. And it's basically him daring them to come fight him. And they're coming in one at a time. He's whooping their ass, beating the shit out of them. And eventually by the end, they're all just trying to rush him at once. And he's just kicking the shit out of them. Very weird promo. Jake the Snake's just kind of watching from the side. Just kind of... <laughs> Like, it's just real raspy-ass voice, and he's just looking mildly amused as Archer is just destroying these dudes. It puts them over, kind of, but none of these guys are wrestlers. They're not even, like, training wrestlers. These are just supposed to be, like, bums off the street that he's whooping the, whooping the shit out of. So, I don't know, man. It didn't do much for me. Uh, it's not great. Archer won't talk in the promo. It's just Jake talking. And, um... You know, you could have had a worse vignette or debut, I guess. It's better than just nothing and just standing in shadows or something. But they're basically making a point. Keep They have the picture of Cody, the Polaroid of Cody, basically stabbed with a knife into the wall. And it's got him circled and it says Caesar next to him. So they're making it clear Cody Rhodes is who they're going to go after. That's a really hot start for Lance Archer for a program. But we're not there yet. We're still talking about it. Jake is talking. They interview him at ringside after the vignette, which was even weirder. Um, and I didn't think this was a strong Jake the Snake promo. I really didn't. It wasn't terrible, but I just didn't think it was super strong. And he eventually kind of finds his footing and makes it clear like, oh, Cody's trying to disregard us, but you won't be able to ignore us forever. All right, cool, man. Uh, then we move on to our fourth and final match here. This it has implications for Blood and Guts, the winner of this six-man tag team match will have the first entrant from their team. So in, it's basically war games, but in Blood and Guts, you have two rings, one cage, and you have two guys, one from each team, starting the match. Then the next man that comes out, um, rather than randomizing it, they put an extra stipulation here where it's like, hey, whichever whoever wins this match, their team gets the first man advantage. So then it's alternating after that. So they have the opportunity for a two-on-one advantage. You can't win a War Games match until all 10 men are in the match anyway. Uh, and then you can't win by pinfall. This is different, a little bit different. You only win by forcing an opponent to quit, like submit or quit, uh, which is interesting how they kind of distinguish that differently i guess you could potentially have like an i quit match type thing where someone's just tired of getting the shit kicked out of them and even though they're not in an active submission would just say okay i give i give so i don't know what's going to happen with that but that's the implication for tonight this is santana and ortiz along with chris hager going up against hangman adam page matt jackson and cody uh the tension is immediately still there with hangman page even though they kind of had that little reluctant uh, mention of solidarity early at the top of the show. They definitely are not holding to it. Meanwhile, you got Chris Jericho on commentary. Man, I'll say this. Jericho had some funny jokes in this show. I mean, he's a fantastic entertainer. I also felt like he didn't have his A game tonight. Like, he, he hit, he landed punches, but he seemed very almost spastic at times where he was like stammering over himself trying to get words out. And it was weird. I mean, there were, there were times where he almost was kind of breaking kayfabe a little bit, where he, he made a couple jokes in a row at Cody's expense, and Taz kind of cracks up a little bit there on commentary, and he's trying to muffle it. And there's a funny moment where Jericho kind of says, like, uh, oh, you're in trouble now, you're, you're in trouble now, Taz. You popped for that or something. I mean, just kind of like smart kind of humor and all that, where he's like kind of in and out of like kayfabe character. It, I mean, it's fine. Uh, Jericho does on commentary really do a good job putting over Cody, which, you know, guy that effectively runs the company. I know that Tony Khan's there, but Matt Jackson and Cody Rhodes were the other two very vital people getting the business side of it, everything set up. So Jericho's putting Cody over. That's nice. 
Cody's taken a lot of the beating early on in this match. You get quick tag outs from Jackson and Paige. For a while, they're not even tagging in Paige. It's just Jackson and Cody going back and forth. And uh, Hangman gets annoyed, tags himself in, even though Jackson has a lot of momentum at one point. So they're really continuing to tease that tension, particularly between those two. And But for a lot of this match early on, Cody's just kind of getting the shit kicked out of him. It's almost like a reversal of those other two tag team matches I mentioned earlier, which still doesn't feel very creative, but at least it's the opposite. If they had continued the same pattern with the good guys working over the bad guys, I would have felt worse about it. But they're doing this instead, and Jericho has a hilarious line uh, in it. He said it actually when Cody was coming out. You know, Arn Anderson comes out. He's the coach of the Nightmare family. He's coming out with like a fucking clipboard. And Jericho, rather than acting like, you know, it's wrestling. It's not like an NFL offensive or defensive coordinator where you get a freaking play sheet there. And Jericho's, you know, making fun of the thing the whole time, basically calling it a Waffle House menu. I laughed my ass off at that one. I thought that was hilarious. And then there's a moment later on where MJF gets involved. Uh, MJF and Luther get involved with uh, Cody on the side, uh, reaching over the barricade and interfering with them. And Anderson comes over and pops Luther like lightly as shit with the the playbook. And Jericho's like, like basically like, what's a Waffle House menu gonna do to Luther? Arn, you gonna give him a paper cut? And I again, I I thought that was hysterical. Um, does nothing to Luther, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting match for sure. There's Jericho has some moments of gold, but I think other than landing those main punches, I felt like the in-between game was not his best compared to what we've seen him doing in AEW thus far. Um, you have a moment before it goes to commercial at one point where it looks like Adam Page is going to walk out on his team and the cameras in the lead up to the commercial break, I thought did a terrible job showing that because if there is some little storyline going on over here and you can't see it the match is focused here you can't see what's going on over there it doesn't even seem like it's happening and then it looks like page before the commercial is just about to leave and you're like what the fuck like how how has this not been built up how has this not been alluded to but then they come back and he's just there like everything's fine and you're like okay that that seems like you were trying to give me some extra little depth or something to the story and then you didn't follow through with it uh after that you have I mentioned earlier, Cody Cody does almost all the work. You eventually get a hot tag from Hangman Page, uh, and it looks like he's got momentum. They have a great tease here again. You finally have a moment where he and Matt Jackson, Hangman and Matt Jackson, look like, all right, yes, we're the same page here. Let's, let's effing do this. And they try and set up. Hangman wants to set up for his buckshot lariat, his finishing move, where he flips over the top rope from the apron and gives just this hellacious lariat. But what Matt Jackson wants to do, rather than throwing the opponent into him or holding him in place for Hangman to do it, he wants to do the Young Bucks move. So he sets up for his spike tombstone, which is the Young Bucks finisher, and Hangman hesitates. He's like, what? Because he like starts to go, and then he pauses. He's like, what do you do? No, I want to do mine. And then he kind of realizes, like, fine, okay, I'll do yours. But that hesitation is all it takes, because then Hager rips his feet as he's trying to jump, and he smacks the shit shit out of his face it looks like on the apron there glad he's not hurt because that looked like an ugly spill very well sold if he uh didn't do it any worse than usual about about perfection you could do for that kind of bump and in the chaos you basically get this moment where then you get a roll up from i believe it's santana who does the roll up one two three Inner Circle wins. They get the one-man advantage, the 2-1 advantage to start, basically, Blood Games. Not to start, but when the first entry comes in, it's their guy. I give this match three and a half stars. Again, I would have liked to have seen much more from Jackson and Cody, from Matt Jackson and Cody. But I felt like this was a pretty good match. It told a good story. It, it incorporated some other existing storylines with MJF on the side. And again, I think they're doing a fantastic job with the division within the elite tier. They keep talking about that. Cody at the top of the show is talking about Hangman Page saying, you know, you don't want to be the other guy because apparently if you go back to like New Japan and all that, you have real questions about who the leader of the Bullet Club was, the elite within the Bullet Club, whether it was Cody or whether it was Kenny Omega. And he kind of references, even though AEW has not done this at all to show it, that Cody and Omega are basically one and one A. Fine. Then you got the Young Bucks, the best tag team in the world, uh, tag team champions, perennial tag team champions. And then you have Hangman Page, who's just kind of out there on his own. He's basically saying, if you don't want to be the other guy, then don't be the other guy. And he's talking about how, you know, I thought when you came in, 
uh, you were going to be the first ever AEW World Champion, but you got beat by Jericho, and there's no shame in that because then I had a shot at Jericho at full lo- uh, fully loaded, and I fell as well. Like, there's no shame in that. So you've been in a bit of a downward spiral emotionally since then. You got to get out of it. You got to fight your way out of it and move on because we had to move on. I can't challenge, and he kind of references his own defeat to Jericho, meaning he can't challenge ever again, which we know he eventually will, for the AEW World Championship. And he's like, I had to put that behind me and move forward. You got to do something similar. You got to find your answer for that. So you had that symmetry at the beginning, and then at the end, you see there's still division. They're just not on the same page, and it costs them another key match here. Now, the show gets very stilted here. Uh, as the inner circle is celebrating, Jericho leaves commentary and he starts, ran- again, not strong promo work at all. He's kind of rambling. Um, you almost wonder if he's a little drunk or something. He's kind of just rambling incoherently about why the inner circle, oh, we're the best team out there. You know, uh, you guys are f- fantastic athletes and all that, no doubt, but we're better and we're better because we're the inner circle and we're better because we haven't argued with each other we haven't hit our moves on each other like he's just kind of rambling about this and it it feels like i don't know if he had to pad time and he just didn't know what to say but it's an awkward dismount and you're like are we just going off the air with him rambling like what the hell is happening it's been like two or three minutes of this then you get as the thumbnail behind me alludes to you get the arrival of vanguard one the drone comes in swoops Over the ring, over the stage, Jericho and them pause mid-word. And then Cody gets on the mic and he says, now again, this really references to me, Hangman, or excuse me, Kenny Omega is still dealing with a broken wrist, is my understanding. And I thought it was kayfabe. He's got a soft cast now, so maybe it is, maybe it's not. It's either a hand or a wrist. Regardless, they've said nothing suggesting that Kenny Omega will not be in this match, blood and guts. So Nick Jackson must have a legit injury if they wrote him off off screen basically last week and now this week he's not there and they're making a point to say we got five members you only got four you're out man and then oh here comes vanguard one cody rhodes basically says or excuse me it's matt jackson saying i called in a favor and your math is wrong and then you cut all the way to the far rafters in the corner of the building the sort of building there in the stands not really rafters and you have matt hardy making his aew debut he is clearly he's doing delete 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 he is in full broken matt hardy mode you have even though you don't see her his wife rebby playing a version of his tna piano entrance music and everything it's a moment that if there had been a crowd there it would have been a huge pop but again circumstances are what they are it's an it's a little bit of an awkward presentation dismount but you have jericho looking concerned so it's apparently going to be the elite four members of the elite plus matt hardy against the inner circle at blood and guts again this is reminiscent to me of when the shield had their first reunion um and then you had the meningitis i think it was uh meningitis infection um what was it no it was mumps that's what it was you had uh, that infection basically at WWE it dismount uh, dis destroys that match basically. You, Bray Wyatt was out with it. Roman Reigns was out with it. Not that Bray was in the match. That's just another guy affected. And then suddenly it's instead of the Shield reunion match, it, you like okay, uh, um, here's Kurt Angle. Here's his in ring return. Now you're wasting the Angle return. What are you doing? Like you just have to scramble sometimes, man. And I kind of get the feeling that's what's happening here. But Matt Jackson. Matt Hardy, Hangman Adam Page, and Cody Rhodes will face off against the entirety of the inner circle at Blood and Guts. I give that final match, if I I said it earlier, three and a half stars. I thought this was a decent little show. Um, I know I gave a really in-depth analysis here. I think it's a decent little show, though. Very short, I mean, in terms of matches, four matches, every single one of them, nothing was one-on-one. I think that was a way of kind of obscuring as well with, you know, noise in the ring obscuring some of the calls of the spots and everything but yeah i don't i don't know man it's it's interesting to me to see what how aew is having to adapt to this they reference at the top of the show they don't even know if they're going to be allowed to hold a dynamite next week and so we're gonna have to see what happens here wrestlemania has already switched now to being a two-night event on wwe network um from the performance center so no fans it's going to be bizarre and they're gonna have to figure out how to work around this but i do think wwe 
Um, cause AEW had the wrestlers in the crowd, but they definitely tried to separate them out a little bit, not just to, uh, fill up some of the space right around that bottom barricade, but also to kind of keep with social distancing as best you can, you know, keep space between them, limit interaction directly. And WWE has a much bigger roster and, you know, NXT and all that as well. They have three rosters compared to one, but, I'm curious to see how they try and incorporate some of that if they do do that, go that route. Because it's going to be surreal what happens in wrestling, just like what happens in the rest of the world in general moving forward. But it's not something that should be overlooked, I don't think. And we'll just, we're just going to have to see. This is going to be a real, real interesting thing. I hope wrestling can continue because I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm in the process of working on my video of the thing. That's coming very soon. I'm re-recording some of my audio today. But I am absolutely at a point where, other than some NFL free agency news, I got nothing else sports-wise to talk about. And as much as I like doing this film analysis stuff, I would like a little bit of counterbalance to it. And right now, AEW is giving me just enough of what I need for that. But we'll see. So that's all for this review, guys. If you like this video, don't forget to leave a like below, subscribe, comment, and uh, don't forget, until next time, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.